Hi, I'm Tom Zimmerman from the EMGR podcast. This is a recorded version of the intro to flash approaches that, um, that I've been doing for the last few months. For those of you who wanted to attend, but weren't able to because you're um, on, on the other side of the world. So um, I want to give you a little bitty introduction to myself and, um, and then we can, we'll get started. Hi, a little bit about me. I'm Tom Zimmerman. I'm a licensed counselor from Ohio. Um, I'm also an EMDRIA approved consultant and provide EMDR therapy trainings through the Institute for Creative Mindfulness. Um, you can reach me at emdrtom.com. I also manage the EMDR therapist resource group on Facebook, which is a really large group of EMDR therapists globally. And how many people have found out about this, um, this little project I'm doing. Also, for the last almost six years, I've maintained the Go With That blog, which is a blog for EMDR therapists about, uh, about the details and the art of doing EMDR therapy. I also manage the EMDR podcast, which focuses on the intersection of EMDR therapy and complex trauma. Also, um, I moderate the Flash Sandbox, which is a Facebook group for people who are looking to um, practicum uh, with other therapists or people who are interested in questions related to Flash-like approaches. So Flash was developed about five years ago, uh, maybe a little longer developed five years ago. It was written up about five years ago. And it was an originally understood as a way to kind of lower distress in memories um, to make EMDR reprocessing a little bit easier. And we've um, since learned that we can use these approaches to pretty consistently, pretty reliably, um, and independently resolve memories um, just using these approaches. Um, I describe what I do as flash-like only because I think in a lot of ways, um, the only person who kind of has the authority to say what Flash is, is its developer, Phil Manfield. Um, and what it is, is pretty rapidly changing and maybe going in ways that, um, that are pretty different from the way that it is um, practiced by some, by some therapist and the way that it's kind of conceptualized um, by myself. So um, different flash approaches tend to have these core qualities. Number one, very light activation of the memory. Um, so we lightly activate the memory. We do not notice it. We push it out of awareness. We load up something which is contradictory to the expectation in that memory. And then we visually disrupt our ability to stay focused on that calm scene. We go in and out of that calm scene. And we do this process over and over and over. We very lightly check the memory, push it out of focus, go into the calm scene, and then blink in the calm scene. And we do this until the distress is a zero. If it seems that flash is a very bizarre approach to psychotherapy, I want to make the point that it's not. Um, what is common between flash and many other transformative trauma therapies are activation. The difference is that in flash, that activation is purposefully light. In EMDR, the activation is pretty direct. Um, there's also noticing the difference. Um, the difference is what we notice. So there's noticing, there's engagement. In fact, we really are promoting the client to have a certain type of experience and that experience is important. And um, there are shifts of focus, right? shifts of focus um, between activation and between the calm scene, shifts of focus between the calm scene and the blinks, which are getting us out of the calm scene. What is, um, what is a little bit unique about flash from other approaches is that activation and noticing are separate. In other approaches, we tend to notice what we've activated 
And flash approaches, we do not. As a matter of fact, they don't work when you notice what you've activated. So we go out of our way not to trip the mousetrap of the, of the amygdala. We go out of our way to bring this memory into working memory, but to not, not to let defenses show up, protective responses show up, um, too much anxiety, too much body response show up. The other way that flash is just different than many is we go in and out of the calm scene. It's different in part because we have this purposeful calm scene, but it's particularly different because we go in and out of this calm scene about every five seconds. The version of flash that I've developed um, with feedback from, from other therapists who've been uh, kind of with me on this journey um, is called the four blinks approach. And it is very, very simple steps and there's only six of them. And the first two um, are things we only typically need to do once. So um, very, very quickly we develop a container and the container in this approach, um, we say it holds the bad memory, but what it really does is the container is going to hold whatever it is in this moment that is active in that memory. So whatever it is in this moment where there's any distress, that little bit of distress, whether it is a body sensation, whether it's a piece of the memory, raw somatic, you know, uh, sensory piece of the memory, uh, whether it's an emotion, whether it's a thought, whatever it is that right here, right now, when we peek in on that memory, it's going to get containered and that little piece, that little slice of it is going into the container. So the container holds the distress of the present when we very briefly glance at the memory. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Central to um, flash-like approaches and really central to many forms of uh, explicit memory reconsolidation approaches are a calm scene. So the calm scene can be anything. And with clients with complex trauma, we typically don't want um, the calm scene to require a lot of cognitive overhead to create. So um, the calm scene can be a pleasant memory of a beach vacation. It can be uh, an imaginal place. It can be an actual process. It can be petting your dog. You're literally petting your dog in this calm scene. It can be a memory of petting your dog. It can be watching, watching a fish, watching your fish in an aquarium. It can be YouTube videos of watching fish or YouTube videos of aquariums or YouTube videos of your favorite uh, comedy uh, sketches. It can be anything that for you induces an experience that disconfirms the experience that's in the, that's in the bad memory. So we develop a container, step one, develop a container, whatever's distressing right here, right now, is gonna just get like one piece of, uh, you know, the husk of a corn at a time, just get shucked into a container. And, um, and then we develop a calm scene. The calm scene is where we're gonna spend most of our time, okay? Next, we identify the memory. It's very important that we identify the memory quickly and lightly and the, the same process with which we identify the memory, we're gonna put it in the container. So identifying the memory and putting it in the container are part of the same process. And a metaphor for that may be kind of glancing at a desktop full of icons, picking the file you want, clicking once on it, not twice, and then just dragging it into a not right now folder, whole folder labeled not right now. So all we're doing is selecting the memory and putting it somewhere. We are not playing any part of it in step three. Step three typically takes seconds. Once the memory we identify is in the container, we push the container 
out of our awareness. And there's lots and lots of ways to do that. You can see the container getting smaller and smaller and smaller. We think of the container kind of as an envelope. So uh, one of the things an envelope does is it hides a little bit what's inside. And then we uh, pivot to our calm scene. We are in our calm scene for about 30 seconds at a time. The way we do that is we say, um, you know, push that memory out of your awareness. Let me know when it's gone. Good, load up your calm scene. Let me know when you're there. When you're in your calm scene, um, the therapist is saying blink every five seconds. And when the therapist says blink, the client is going out of the calm scene into the present to do blinking. And after a few blinks, the, th the client goes right back into the calm scene. So we're doing this five times. So what that means is that for about the better part of five seconds, the client is in the calm scene, they blink, they go back into the calm scene, they blink, they go back into the calm scene, blink back into the calm scene, blink back into the calm scene, blink back into the calm scene. Blink, so they're in this calm scene six different times through the, you know, through the five blinks. And then after that, what we do very, very quickly is we say something like very quickly, open the door, close it, whatever it is right here, right now, that's distressing in that memory, see it go into your container. And again, this is a micro exposure, just open the door and close it. Whatever it is that's distressing right here, right now, see that go into your container, see it go out of your awareness. Good. Then once, once the memory is out of your awareness, containered and out of your awareness, we go right back to step four, where we're in the calm scene and do blinks. Okay. And that's where we're spending almost all of our time is between steps four and step five. And the vast majority of that time is spent in step four. So we do this until the suds is a zero. And very often, very, very, very often, the suds goes to a zero pretty quick. What a suds going to a zero means, by the time we, you know, by the time we've been in step four and step five a while, is we keep peeking into the memory. And all we're doing in this case is imagine the memory kind of being like a room. and We're just peeking into the room. And before too long, there's going to be a point at which the client opens the door, peeks into the room, and is, doesn't find anything in that view from that perspective that is distressing. So once a client can kind of open the door to the memory, look around some, can't find anything distressing, that's when we walk into the room and we start looking under the cushions. We start looking behind the couch um, because the room's not cleared until every part of the room is cleared. So what we do in step six is we walk through a video of the memory and we're simply looking for distress. So often clients will be able to walk through the frames of the video and they'll go, oh, I got it. And what we want the client to do is the moment the client has it, I want them to let me know, indicate that they found the distress, and I want them to immediately container it. So they identify the distress, they container it. We go right back into our calm scene, 30 seconds at a time, blinks every five seconds. And then when we're done, what we can do is we can check on the piece that the piece in that video that just had heat, if it still has heat, container it again. It's so very likely that whatever that, whatever heat is in that piece is likely to have lost a lot of its distress if it's not a zero. But we want to kind of digest this, digest this piece of video one chunk at a time. And once this piece is digested, once there's a suds of a zero, we'll play it forward. And there probably will be another blip. There'll be another piece of memory content that has a little bit of heat as we're walking through the frames. And we're not done until you can play every part, every part of that memory, every part of that video and the distress is zero. So this was a quick sprint through the four blinks approach. If you go to fourblinks.com, F-O-U-R-B-L-I-N-K-S.com, 
Um, there's a detailed script that will walk you through how to do each of these steps. There are videos that will walk you through each of these steps in pretty good detail. There's also videos that will walk you through troubleshooting um, these approaches. If it's not working reliably, predictably, consistently, um, the troubleshooting tip should be able to explain uh, pretty consistently what's going on. Again, if flash-like approaches seem a little bit bizarre, they really are, I believe, one of the most explicit forms of memory reconsolidation um, approaches that we have. And what a memory reconsolidation approach is, and again, this comes out of uh, ultimately lab research of the last 21 years, um, translated, you know, translated what that means is that we have learned that when you activate a difficult memory, it creates a window in which we might be able to modify or make changes to that memory. In fact, when we do load a memory into awareness, we're almost certainly making some kind of changes to it. And this is something that's not particularly controversial in trauma recovery. Um, just imagine a memory, for instance, when you were young, that may have been a bad memory, which we revisit and other contexts come in. And then we can make what had been a bad memory an even worse memory, an even more you know, dispositionally defining uh, memory. So um, what transformational trauma therapies do is they unlock, you know, activate, unlock, bring into awareness a, a memory, and then transform that memory, transform many different aspects of it and move it or ooch it in a positive direction. And the way we do that in memory reconsolidation approaches is we activate a memory and then we promote an experience. And the important part is an experience. And this is why the calm scene in Flash needs to be salient. It needs to be an experience and not just something you're seeing. So what we do, again, activate a difficult memory to select it, to highlight it, to bring it into awareness, almost like we're going to double click on that zip file and unzip it. And now we get access to the file and may be able to make some adjustments to it. And the way we do that is right next to it, we um, let the nervous system have an experience which challenges the expectation that is built into that bad memory. So whatever is in the bad memory, whatever schema is in there, we wanna promote an experience that disconfirms that challenges the expectation or prediction that is in that bad memory. And in Flash, we do this over and over and over and over and over. We'll talk a little bit more about that. The case that I'm making when it comes to Flash approaches done well is that they really do transform every aspect of the memory. And it really does not just remove distress, not just partially process a memory, but fully process a memory by every way that we would consider a memory resolved in any other transformational psychotherapy. So let me make my point using EMDR as an example. So what I want to do is define what a process or reprocess memory looks like, what a resolved traumatic memory looks like in EMDR. So on the left side, formally, you know, using Shapiro language, the distress in the memory is a zero or neutral, and it stays that way. The validity of the belief about the self is seven out of seven true, and there's a clear body scan when visiting the memory. We may also technically have also worked in the um, present and future prong. We may have worked on present and future prong targets um, to consider a, a particular past memory resolved. So if you've been a trauma therapist who has been working with a trans, uh, transformational, meaning it completely changes in one session, one memory, um, these other things are also indicators that that memory has been resolved. 
The memory feels like it happened when it did. The memory functions and behaves the same way it would have if we'd been able to digest it at the time that it happened. Another way to say it is the memory gets inserted into the timeline where it belongs and it behaves like a memory that is a normal memory inserted into the timeline at that place will behave. The client will tell you, all parts of the client will tell you that the memory feels over. Intrusive symptoms drawing from the memory um, typically will stop. By this, we mean flashbacks related to that experience will stop, as will trauma-related dreams. The reprocessed memory tends to generalize. What, what we mean by that is that when we work on and clear one memory, clearing one memory in EMDR may clear dozens of adjacent and similarly shaped, similarly, similarly positioned memories. And then the resolved memory becomes adaptive information about the self and the world. So this is pretty darn remarkable. I mean, this is, I mean, if, 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 if a psychotherapy can do this, this is pretty darn amazing. And it is what is uh, remarkable about EMDR is it does provide a pretty deep clean. From a flash perspective, um, flash does the same thing. Granted, it is a completely different way to make the journey. So it does it in a different way. And just like a journey on an airplane is a completely different journey than a journey in a car. And a journey in a car is a completely different journey than a journey on a bicycle. So the point and my point is that flash gets us there. Flash-like approaches get us there. And what do we mean by that? What I mean by that is that the distress is a zero and stays a zero. There's also a clear body scan when visiting the memory. This little blue part here, um, flash approaches do not cause shifts in positive cognition only because we do not inquire about them. What I can promise is that when a memory resolves in flash, very, very often, there is a positive cognition. And that positive cognition, um, clients tend to believe pretty strongly. So what I think may be happening here, right? And we'll get, we'll get a little bit more into this um, in a moment. But what's happening here is that flash is clearing a memory. And what resolving a memory means is that all aspects of that memory get transformed. The distress gets neutralized. The way we think about ourselves related to that memory is much more positive, much more um, generous and much more realistic. And again, there's a clear body scan when, when visiting the memory. In every other metric that we would consider either formally or informally, a memory resolved, flash meets every single, every single benchmark. The other point is that the reprocess memory in flash really does seem to generalize. I doubt it generalizes as much as a memory may generalize in EMDR, only because in EMDR, so many channels, so many connections are coming online, but I have plenty of evidence from my clients and from the little bit of, um, from the little bit of, uh, you know, target selection that we do, that um, often clearing out one memory will resolve adjacent memories. So I'm pretty sure that to some degree, generalization is happening in flash. And this is not a huge surprise because again, it is entirely possible that what a memory being reprocessed means is that it becomes adaptive information about the self and the world, which can help leverage other forms of adjacent healing. So we should not be surprised that when a memory gets resolved, um, that resolution looks similar regardless of the approach that we use. Okay, so what I'm saying, and this is the point, this is my whole point 
why I'm in, why I am in, incredibly excited about these approaches and why I really do believe they're going to transform the way we deliver mental health services globally in this century is the realization, right? And it's a, it's a really, it's a profound and remarkable realization. So when I started seeing client after client after client heal in this way, um, and not just heal um, a little bit, heal pretty dramatically, heal in pretty profound ways. Um, it became very clear to me from a much broader perspective that this is a remarkable, remarkable time to be alive. Because what I realized is, is that, do you mean to tell me that through all the wars, through all the bad moms, through all the bad men, through all of the, you know, losses of parenthood, through all of the, you know, catastrophes that have made up this collective communal experience of being human. Through all of that, we have had the capacity to heal ourselves by lightly bringing a memory into awareness, pushing it out of awareness, imagining something pleasant and disrupting our concentration on that. That is it. Um, that is amazing. The ability for us to sit in a calm scene, disrupt our concentration on that calm scene, can let us get a lava hot file out of a lava hot file folder, put it on the table, and do things that just disrupt that. And then that memory can ooch, ooch, ooch into an absolutely normal memory folder. That is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, the idea that we can process trauma with minimal, minimal distress, process trauma reliably, predictably, consistently is a game changer in, in the 21st century. It just simply is. So this is a little bit um, just, and there's, there's more, there's growing information about flash approaches um, from a research perspective. I encourage you to check it out. Some of it's pretty interesting. Um, how I use flash-like approaches being a, as an EMDR therapist, um, you don't have to be an EMDR therapist, but since, you know, in order to use flash approaches, but many of the people that are likely to be exposed to this approach are EMDR therapists. So I want to tell you how I use it and encourage you, you know, perhaps to use it in, in similar ways. So one of the things I do while I'm preparing the client for the EMDR journey, we will target um, often as soon as the second session. And I know that this has to be a little bit surprising to hear, but as soon as the second session, we are targeting whatever trauma symptoms are most contributing to current instability, whether it's flashbacks that have happened in the last week or, or trauma-related dreams or any type of triggering related to trauma, you know, trauma insecurities. Whatever it is that has been contributing to client instability, those are the things we're going to work on first. Another thing, as an EMDR therapist, it's super, super handy, particularly when you're working with clients with complex trauma, is that they are going to have all kinds of catastrophes that they're going to need to process with you. Their lives tend to be, in a pretty ongoing way, pretty unmanageable. So what that means is if you are an EMDR therapist and you work with clients with complex trauma, there may be many sessions where you have tasks that just take half the session and we may not start an EMDR session, you know, 25, 35 minutes into the session, but that's plenty of time to do a flash session and, and actually resolve a memory in that second half of a, of a session. Flash works well for somatically dissociated clients, clients who may not be very in their bodies at all. Um, related to that, your overly rational clients, 
clients who EMDR who may try to process on the thought, 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 thought channel. Um, and again, in EMDR, the difficulty in EMDR is that the difficult stuff has to connect to right now existing adaptive information. And if you have severe, severe developmental and attachment wounding, you probably have some pretty pervasive deficits in adaptive information. I'm also likely to use um, flash approaches with clients who have um, kind of body-based catastrophes that may happen in EMDR, abreactive vomiting, high risk of panic attacks. Um, my clients with DID issues, um, their parts do tend to consent to the flash journey with much more ease than the EMDR journey. Um, they just do. It's a lot easier. And as a matter of fact, some of the best work that I've done with clients with, um, with DID issues have been in a flash context. It, is, it is, has been in my practice a pretty, pretty big deal, pretty significant game changer and actually unburdening uh, many, many, many parts of the self and what they carry. Um, in the era of telehealth, if I only have a voice connection with a client, I am incredibly unlikely to do EMDR. Um, I've never done EMDR through a voice connection. I am very comfortable walking a client through flash, through the telephone only. Um, one of the things that is pretty cool about having multiple transformational trauma therapies is that we can give the client the option of how they want to interact with the memory today. So um, a client that is prepared for the MDR journey and a client that is prepared for the flash journey, um, I may simply ask the client, once we do a little bit of identification of what the client needs to work on, I may ask, how do you, how do you want to work today? And for those of you who may be um, very, very structured, who, who may see a lot of what your role is as really lining up the client's targets for them, this may seem a little bit free form, but with clients with complex trauma, um, one of the most important things we can do is, is recognize that this is the client's journey and give them the power, give them the control, give them the agency to identify what they need to work on and decide on their own, you know, using their own assessment of where they are and what they need today, how they want to take this journey. I can make recommendations, but it is incredibly liberating the idea not to be confused about whose journey this is and um, let the clients make the journey in the way that they choose on, on any given day or any particular day. And a lot of times clients will say, I want to work on this memory using EMDR today. I have the energy. Um, it's going to clear out more. And I want to do that. Other times they may say, look, look, Tom, I got to see my mom tonight. I don't really want to, you know, do the EMDR approach. Um, tonight. Let's do flash this time. We'll circle back around, do something, something later with EMDR. Um, flash is so reliably, reliable, predictable, consistent, that after several sessions where clients have been able to successfully do this in session, I'm likely to send them home with instructions to do flash on their own between sessions using whatever is, has seeped out of their trauma container. So if they're having an insecurity, if they have, if they have a particular you know, trauma-related memory that keeps wanting to come up, um, and my clients are coming back, almost all of them coming back and telling me that Flash has become a major, major, coping strategy between session that lets them manage things that are coming up. And um, what this means is that my clients are not, they're, they're, they're not, I'm not sending them home to reach into their trauma container 
grab something terrible and work on it. What I'm doing is I'm recognizing that when they have trauma seeping, they're going to have to deal with that in some way. And I'd rather them deal with it in a way that's built around container and calm scene, which is likely to end in sunshine, rather than to deal with it in ways that, um, that may not be nearly as effective. So my clients, long story short, are processing their own seeping trauma between session. And that is huge. That is a big deal. It just is. Okay. If we had magic to design a treatment for trauma, we had unlimited resources, we had magic, we had the ability to, to make it whatever we wanted. In a lot of ways, it would have many of the qualities of flash. It would be fast, safe, reliable, um, and relatively pain, painless. Why? Because carrying trauma is an awful, awful experience enough. We don't want the treatment to itself be God awful. Um, any ideal trauma therapy should be easy to experience, you know, easy to administer. Um, we need to heal the world. This is not just about healing um, people who can afford it in Western, con uh, Western countries. So um, you shouldn't need a PhD or even an MA in order to administer this form of therapy. Because why? Because this is a pathway that is built into humans. This is our common heritage. Nobody owns it. It is something that is a birthright. It is a function of being human to be able to ex access healing pathways that have been with us since we've had this brain. An ideal trauma therapy would be effective and reliable even for clients with the most severe forms of trauma. It would not cause clients, it would not have a tendency toward causing clients to decompensate or for any of their symptoms to get worse. It wouldn't require a lengthy preparation and it would fully and adaptively resolve memories. Also, there would be some generalization so that clearing out one memory might also clear out some adjacent memories. And my claim and my argument is that flashlight approaches do all of these. And if this were a medication, it would be one of the biggest medication stories um, of the 21st century. Probably it would be one of the biggest stories of the 21st century. And again, flash does this. So, I'm encouraging people to get trained, formally trained, in which you can get CEUs for this, um, just to cover your basis. If you want to train with the developer of Flash um, at flashtechnique.com, you can train with Phil Manfield. His trainings tend to be about six hours long. They are very affordable. Phil Manfield and Ricky Greenwald's um, trainings are very affordable. Um, Ricky Greenwald's training uh, through the Child Trauma Institute is three hours long. I believe it's 84 or $88. Um, and it will teach you almost everything you need to know, um, including practicum. So um, they're, they're there. Um, I would encourage you to get formally trained. Um, if you really want to do this approach with your clients with complex trauma, that is what I'm focusing on. Um, my script, again, is at fourblinks.com. It is not copyright. It is open source. You are allowed to use it. You're allowed to share it. You're allowed to train it. You're allowed to change it and make it, you know, make it your version. Um, I would encourage you to, to check that out. Um, a lot of thought has gone into um, how do we do flash um, reliably, safely, predictably with clients with really, really extensively um, extensive and complex trauma. If you want to practice flash with other therapists, again, you can join the flash sandbox group on Facebook. Um, the URL is right there. And um, so again, 
what I'm claiming in this training is something that I would have found um, pretty preposterous even a year ago, which is that we can resolve memories um, using, using memory reconsolidation approaches that are, um, that are calm, right? That do not require that we sit with the distress of the memory where we, um, where the processing occurs in a completely calm and relaxing state, um, that is, that is simply transformative. And the reason that I'm doing these trainings, the reason that I'm sharing this with as many people as I can, um, is because there are ways to do this, the ways to do this reliably, predictably, consistently, safely. And I think um, as many people as possible, as many people, uh, as many therapists as who understand um, trauma, who are trauma informed, who are trauma focused, um, need to have this tool. It's a remarkable tool. It's a powerful tool. And I'm committed in helping you do it with your client reliably, consistently, predictably. If you are not seeing clients resolve session after session after session in 30 minutes or less memories, be in touch with me. I want to help you do this reliably, consistently, um, and safely over and over and over and over while you're preparing clients to do other forms of healing. So let me know um, how I can be helpful. Again, easiest way to reach me is probably at emdrtom.com. Um, do check out fourblinks.com. Almost everything that I, I have ever said, almost everything I've ever um, produced um, about flash-like approaches are there. Clients who can't visualize, there are tools there for how you do that. Um, clients struggling with overactivation, there's information there about hand, how to handle that. Clients in flash opening up too many memory targets at once, there's strategies there for how to deal with that. 